Okay, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. So I'm Samin Vizier, I'm the chair of this session, and I'm just gonna introduce the speakers and moderate the, the question and answer period. So our first speaker is Carl Bergstrom, who's a professor uh, in the Department of Biology at the University of Washington. And he studies how to model uh, the flow of information through biological and social systems. Um, and he does this using methods and, and theories from biology, informatics, and philosophy and sociology of science. And you've probably heard of him from his Twitter activity and possibly his book and, uh, and course that he co-teaches and co-wrote with Jevin West called Calling Bullshit, which is about how to detect new school bullshit, not old school bullshit, um, in things like media and science and in modern technology and social media and so on. So I'll turn it over to Carl now for his presentation. All right, thanks, Samin. Can you hear me? Okay, great. So, um, so yeah, so uh, is it possible to have a career in a meta researcher? Well, let me start with why you might want to. For me, science is the greatest human invention ever. And it is because it gives us the ability to navigate and understand the universe on scales that we don't have the sensory apparatus to do. We haven't evolved sensory apparatus that allow us to understand things on the scales of, uh, of you know, hundreds to thousands of light years or time scales over billions of years or femtoseconds. We don't have the sensory apparatus to help us understand you know, the structure of DNA. We can't see that, we can't feel it, taste it, touch it, hear it. And yet science gives us the, lets us build the tools for ourselves to have these superpowers to understand the world on these scales. And through that, we can do things like, um, you know, create an airplane that we can fly in a little metal tube, three, three, you know, um, 30,000 feet above, above earth while, uh, you know, streaming something on Wi-Fi or uh, if a new infectious disease emerges uh, out of out of bats, we can create a vaccine, an effective vaccine for that in in less than a year. Um, this is the sorts of things that science could do for us. But the thing is, is and we have to understand is that science isn't arbitrary. Science, as we practice it, is the norms and institutions we practice are basically a sort of a haphazardly culturally evolved uh, set of of norms and institutions that came out of the way that some people were thinking about natural philosophy in, in, in Europe in the, um, in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries, right? And so um, while science is this amazing way to get at the nature of the universe, um, it is by no means the one true path, but rather a very um, contingent, arbitrary one that we seem to have landed on. Uh, one that happens to work well for us and, and, and maybe is, is sort of jury rigged over the evolved psychology of our species, but it's by no means an absolute. If bees did science, it would probably look really different from you know, the science that, that we do. And so it, you know, this gives us, we can sort of look at it, or at least the way I look at the whole thing is you think about norms creating incentives, the norms institutions that we work within create these incentives, scientists respond to them, they choose research strategies. Those research strategies form what we learn about the world, there ends up being this direct link between norms and institutions and the and and what we think of as as you know the the, the framework within we within which we do science and the knowledge that we have that comes out the other end but of course those norms and institutions are themselves rather hap, uh, you know haphazard and happenstance and this provides us with this enormous opportunity right uh, you know science works very very well but of course it could work a lot better and now we're asking different kinds of questions and problems than the ones that we were asking when those norms and institutions emerged. And so this all gives us the opportunity to construct a new way of doing science, a new set of norms and institutions and, 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 and practices uh, that'll be better matched to the kinds of uh, questions and problems we're asking today, to the kinds of enormous data sets we have access to, and, and so forth. And that's, to me, tremendously exciting. And, and it's why, you know, doing uh, meta science, meta research is, is uh, is such a fantastic draw. We absolutely need brilliant people that are committed to doing this. And the catch though, of course, is that meta research is not yet a fully formed discipline with faculty lines, its own departments and, and all of that, right? And so trying to shape an academic career where you're going into something where there isn't a set track, path, et cetera, can be very, very difficult. You know, people are not putting out the numbers of ad job ads for meta research uh, scholars as they are for biologists or psychologists or whatever. And so I would say, you know, to answer the question, by all means, pursue a career doing work in meta research, but you've got to be very strategic about it because otherwise the opportunities just simply aren't there. You 
at this point, I, you know, I hate to say this, is I wish I didn't have to say this, but I can't in good faith advise anything else. You gotta find a home base in another discipline. So many possible disciplines that it could be, and I've just listed a few here, but of course there are so many, each of those bring different things, different perspectives to this broad interdisciplinary problem of meta research. So you're gonna have value there um, and do great work there. And maybe you've sort of seen this coming with the last three slides, but uh, you know, you're gonna have to moonlight um, and you're gonna have to do one thing um, and then you're going to have to, you know, which is your, your, your bread and butter thing. And then you're going to have to do meta research around that, integrate it with the other research that you do. Because right now, that's how you're going to form a career, get tenure, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That's how I've done it myself. I, uh, you know, got first interested in all of this by about in about 2000, thinking about uh, the economics around journal publishing and open access. I, uh, at that point, had already been hired as an assistant professor at the University of Washington doing theoretical biology. Uh, from there, that sort of led me into thinking about uh, larger scale bibliometric problems, how to map the structure of science, uh, questions like that. Um, again, you know, a part of my research project program, but only a part on the side. Um, since then, I've sort of moved more and more into thinking about the science of science, the new economics of science, working on these problems. I actually think, you know, as a full professor where no one can really tell you what to do or what you have to work on, I could actually do this pretty much full time. And that was the plan until COVID hit. I was trained as an epidemiologist. And so that pulled me away for a while. Um, but the point is, is that you, you know, there's a lot of room to do this kind of work. You can be very successful at it. You're going to absolutely find an audience. I mean, instead of rolling in to give a talk and say, let me tell you about how some protein binds to some other protein, neither of which you've ever heard of, and I'm not going to remember to tell you the organism. I'm going to walk in, I'm going to say, let me tell you about you and the thing you do all day long, and then talk about at the bar at night. And that's a talk that has an audience. So you will find people that are interested and you can bring, you'll be able to get enthusiasm around your work. The trick is going to be finding people that want to hire in that area in the first place. The good journals are taking interest. You know, I've been able to publish in, in the top, uh, you know, generalist um, sort of glossy journals in, in this area. Funders are taking interest. Both uh, foundations are very useful in this respect um, and have provided a lot of funding and interest, as many of you know, but uh, even from the standard governmental funding bodies, I've had a couple of NIH grant, NSF grants to work in this area, et cetera. So, that is more doable. Really, the, the, the trick is finding that home base. And uh, right now, I don't see an easy way to do it other than having this sort of disciplinary, uh, ordinary disciplinary focus. So, you know, to sort of summarize, um, this is what I tweeted about, uh, about uh, less than an hour and a half ago. I guess I'm speaking 75 minutes about whether or not you could, should, should pursue a career in meta research. TLDR, don't quit your day job. So, Absolutely. It's a great thing to do. It's really exciting. It's really fun. It's going to change science possibly more than anything else you could do. I once had a colleague who, who told me, you know, that uh, he was a very well-known astronomer uh, who who'd made some big discoveries in astrophysics, but he also uh, designed ADS, the Astrophysics Data Server, and he calculated how much time that effort, which I see as kind of a, you know, meta research adjacent, right, it's changing the way we do science. And he, he calculated that over the last, you know, 15 years, that it saved about 55 FTEs a year in terms of faculty time in his field. And he said, look, I don't care how good I think I am. I know I'm not worth 55 fellow researchers. This is the most important thing I've ever done in my career. And I feel like making even, you know, 1% incremental change in the way we're able to think about science and do science more effectively is going to be more influential than anything else that I would ever have a possibility of doing in my career in my home base in evolutionary biology. So um, with respect, so here I'm of course focusing on faculty jobs and, and because that's what I know about. Um, and uh, and so that's kind of that's kind of my my message, you know, go for it. Just make sure you've got a, a day job, a home base. And as your career advances, you can reach more and more into this area. And of course the entire landscape will be changing uh, over time as well. So thank you for letting me talk. You can, you know, look at some of this stuff here if, if you care. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Carl. That was a really great perspective from within academia.
and we'll be hearing from different perspectives throughout this panel. So yeah, keep the questions coming in the chat and, and comments, anything else you want to put in there. Um, so our next presenter and panelist is uh, Jennifer Byrne, who's the director of the biobanking um, of biobanking in, with New South Wales Health Pathology, and is also a conjoint professor at the University of Sydney. Um, and she's also working in the academic sector, but will bring a different perspective and um, a perspective from her background as a cancer researcher and how that led her to her current work in meta research. So over to you. Uh, thank you, Samin. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Yep. Yep, great. Okay, so yeah, thanks very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm going to start by showing a couple of pictures of birds, and this is largely for Carl because I understand he's a big bird fan. Uh, I understand he spent uh, he spent some time as a teenager in Australia, and he became obsessed about parrots. And interestingly, this is an obsession that we share. As a child growing up in the country, I was completely obsessed about birds, and I was going to become a bird scientist. Um, so I thought I'd start out by showing a couple of amazing birds that I used to see um, on my property as a child. And I think this kind of the wonder of nature was something that really drew me to a career as a scientist. King parrot and, and, and which rosella? Uh, pale headed. I knew you'd know. Actually, no, sorry, it's not a king parrot. It's a, it's a crimson wing. It's a crimson wing. Yes. But, um, crimson and it's a pale headed yeah. rosella. But yes, beautiful birds. So, yep, yeah, I went just a little bit about myself. So I went to sort of uh, state schools in the country won a scholarship to a private girls' school in Brisbane, which is a couple of Queensland, did all of my university at the University of Queensland, went overseas, was a postdoc in France and got married over there, came back to Australia, had my first child fairly quickly after coming back to Australia, second child after I moved to the Children's Hospital at Westmead, and I stayed there for a long time. Um, and then I accepted my current role here at the Statewide Biobank of New South Wales Health Pathology in 2019. So I guess, is it possible? Yes but it's a slow yes in my case. So I started out studying um, you know, plasticity of the brain and then I switched to cancer predisposition and molecular genetics for my uh, PhD and I stayed in that field for a long time. And then I had, some I had the opportunity to start to study this function that I'd been involved with pretty much all my cancer career, which is biobanking. And I started to actually study biobanking. And that was the first opportunity that I had to do what was really medicine research where I stopped studying something and started studying the process of science itself. So um, biobanking, what does it do? It provides bio, biomedical sort of samples for research and data. And that's a big part of what's been described as the research reproducibility crisis in preclinical research. So we've done a lot in biobanking over the years. This is an example of a recent paper where we did a bibliometric analysis of what's published around biobanking. We also published a commentary last year about how biobanks can sort of weather the COVID-19 pandemic and how that relates to its effects on research. While I was studying biobanking, this quote that um, is a favourite one of mine sort of sprung to mind, and that is really the stewards of our professions, we have to continually consider, are we basically leaving our field in a state that is better or worse than we ended it? And I think through biobanking, I realised that research was in a fairly bad state. The other quote that I really like is from Pasteur, which is, you know, this quote about, you know, in the fields of observation, chance favours only the prepared mind. And I think it was my background in cancer research, plus my exposure to meta-research that led me to the um, research integrity stuff that we're doing now. So this will be first published something in 2017 about seeing striking similarities between papers from China that describe these gene knockdown experiments. Uh, we realised that they, some of these papers were characterised by reagents that were completely wrong. This is our most recent paper was covered in Nature last year as a preprint. And unfortunately, what we think we are studying is uh, research paper mills. I've just shown a brief sort of ecosystem, those of how they might function. Essentially, the paper mills produce research content uh, that we think is probably entirely fabricated. The journals sort of help drive that, they benefit institutions, help drive that and benefit. Of course, they need researchers as authors that provide money. And so the wheel turns and it is a very distressing thing to study. Um, we have been asked to write about this, for example, for Nature. So I was asked to write about this in 2019. And I think if I was still studying genes in cancer, I don't think Nature would be asking me to write anything about that. So I essentially stopped doing lab research because I realised that paper mills can do this far more quickly, easily and cheaply than we can. This is just a little diagram to show how difficult it is to do laboratory research. This paper that we published in Developmental Cell in 2010, we started the experiments back here in about 2001. It takes nearly 10 years. Most of these papers on this slide took nearly five years to get to, to do. 
from beginning to end. Why is that? It's because there are so many steps in doing laboratory research. A lot of regulatory approval, you need to get hold of people, reagents, equipment, you need to do experiments. Experiments are really hard. It's like playing a concerto on a piano. You know, very few people can do some of these kinds of things. You have to do that over and over to get data, which takes years to publish. So meta research actually, in my opinion, is a lot easier than laboratory research. You don't have to worry about a lot of these things. You don't need fancy equipment. You don't need to buy antibodies. You don't have to optimize many different experimental systems over and over. That's the really good news, I think. It is quicker, fewer regulatory requirements, no reagent sourcing, no need for years of thumping experiments at the bench. Um, it's easier from a technical point of view, it is cheaper. Those are, that's the good thing. So how to make it happen? Look, I think as Carl said, you know, you can, you can do a, you know, what Carl referred to as moonlighting is I'm talking about starting a side project. It's possible for meta research, it's impossible for laboratory research. So take advantage of that. You can do something on the side and do something meaningful. But think about where you start is often where you stay. That was my case. I started in cancer research. I stayed there for many, many years. It's, it, it's, it can be challenging to move. So the sooner you start to plan that, the quicker you'll do it. I also think we have to ditch this deficit model. I think this happens a lot in women in science. You know, how do we convert ourselves to something else? Think about what you're really great at, what you are talented at, what kind of unique person you can become. From my own background, you know, I grew up in a really like monotonous environment, but that made me a very observant person. It allowed me to cope with uncertainty. It allowed me to make the best of situations because that's all we had. And I think those things have helped me to become the kind of scientist that I am. So I thought I'd just finish with this by saying that, yeah, science is amazing. You do have opportunities to study the equivalent of this. And I think we're very fortunate. And look, I really look forward to some discussion. This is a bit about our team. Thanks so much for the invitation. Great, thank you so much, Jenny. That was really great. I just wanna point out the kind of interesting potential irony of so far, both of our speakers have mentioned, you know, the outlets that have recruited them to write papers or that they've published in, but these are also two of the people who would be the first to tell you that, you know, prestige and the glossiness and all that is not necessarily what we ought to be paying attention to. But I do think it's a really important point and, and echoes my own experience that despite the fact that universities may not create lines to hire people like this, we do very, very well on the metrics that they care about, maybe ironically. Um, so that's an interesting thing we could, we could talk more about if people are interested in. Um, great. Okay, our third speaker, who I think is here, James Heathers, is the Chief Scientific Officer at Cypher Skin, and before that was a, a PhD student and postdoc in biopsychology. He's from Australia, but lives in the US now, and he has done a lot of work on meta-research in detecting and reporting errors and misconduct in the published literature, developing tools to help us do the same or avoid those kinds of errors. And also you've probably heard of him because of his um, activity on social media, his blog posts, his podcasts. He's an amazing science communicator, has really a way with words like no one else I know. So if you haven't read his blog posts and other communications, I would encourage you to go and do that after this session. So over to you, James. If you have slides, feel free to share screen. No worries if not. This is the nice part about uh, presenting with people like Carl and Jennifer, both of whose work I know very well, is that I do not have sufficient professionalism to put slides in front of you, um, to have a conversation about the career I don't now have. Um, this is a really interesting topic. I said yes more or less immediately when I was, when I was asked to speak about this, because I made what for a lot of people here is probably a reasonably unusual choice. I, I recognize maybe a quarter of the names here. Hello to people I've met. I see the vast majority of you are still at your grindstones. I myself have chosen a completely different kind of grindstone. That is even worse. <laughs> That's why I look 10 years older than the last time you saw me. Uh, I work at a startup now. I'm the chief scientific officer of a company that builds uh, biomedical wearable devices. So we do a variety of other things as well. And I have a similar experience to our last two speakers in the fact that, especially in the times of the plague, I have received more invitations to write something fancier than I ever have before. In that it all of a, all of a sudden, 
the relevance of the kind of collective research accuracy, um, the relevance of how we investigate broader scientific systems and how we think about how the subcomponents are put together, all of a sudden became even more relevant in a way where you could, uh, COVID was the only time I ever heard about epidemiology on the news. Um, that was that was truly interesting. You, you, you haven't lived till you've heard CBS say a new epidemiological study. And I thought, why couldn't, why couldn't you have sorted that out before we had a, a, a virus? I mean, it was always worth reporting. Bless you. So Carl mentioned something about the violation of norms. And I think that was a strong component in why I don't do meta research in the formal capacity anymore, because I've violated quite a lot of them. Um, and I heard sotto voce that it was somewhat problematic. So at the exact point in time when global scientific infrastructure got hit, I left meta research probably because I violated a few of those in combination with the fact, of course, that the job market was very terrible. Um, but let's talk about corporate work and non-academic work in terms of how it fits in within, how can I have a career within meta science? So I'm going to say something that's very similar in terms of, will you become uh, someone who works in an area that's adjunct to what you've actually studied? Because God knows there's, there's not a lot of startup meta scientists, uh, and God forbid there's any corporate meta scientists. But I do not view this through the terms of I need to have an academic home base and I'm going to work on this because it's something that excites me, neither in terms of this is a side project. For me, increasingly over time, and something that I recommend to other people is view it entirely through the lens of skills conferred. In other words, if this is an area of research that you're interested in, I would assert that in many respects, you are a better scientist than other people. So what happens now? What happens now is I get job ads from people and they say, I want to work. I, I mean, right now I need a, uh, um, I need a biomechanist. Uh, I probably need another uh, research engineer. I need to hire all these people and I get resumes. Now, if I get a resume that has preprints in it and GitHub links in it, I promise you I take it more seriously than someone who says, I have a variety of experience in this because I, I'm, I am allowed to inspect what they have done immediately. And in many respects, something interesting that you find, especially when you work with engineers, is that our collective culture on this phone call is much more similar to many other digital life cultures than it is to traditional academic culture. You will find a tremendous commonality with uh, open source software, for instance, which I know we sort of are adjacent to and cross over with hackers, with engineers who share resources, where everything that we talk about in terms of this is a principle of how science should work is simply a well, well understood, a well accepted area of how digital information is communicated, which is essentially what it comes down to. Synthesize, criticize, understand, evaluate, contextualize. I think you're better at it. So from my perspective, if we're talking about, the, I can't think of any area actually within the, the sort of happy family of meta-scientific endeavors where I think it would be any kind of drawback if you went to get an external job. Certainly, the more critical I've been, frankly, the more problems that I've managed to solve. It is very different outside of academic environs when, when the norms change to be the most critical person in the room and then suddenly find everyone turning to you to say, we need to be able to find holes in this. We need to know whether or not we can sign this. We need to know whether or not we can see through the data that is being presented to us. And I saw someone already shared some suggestions about uh, what, you, what you can and can't do. Um, alternative careers. Well, as has previously been suggested, I think they will hinge off whatever is your personal domain of expertise, which I'm assuming from a lot of people here is social scientific, but not entirely confined. However, I guarantee you, 
I really do guarantee you that what you learn and the lens through which you see how information needs to be synthesized will make you better at doing a job like mine. The first meetings were when we were doing external work uh, in the end of 2020. Um, and people would come in and they would either offer us a lot of money uh, to buy a piece of the company or they'd offer us a lot of money to buy the company itself or they wanted to collaborate. We had to get off those phone calls and then I had to make a decision with my little baby. I gave, made myself a little, a little dunce hat when I started, which was funny. Everyone likes to see someone in the C-suite wearing a dunce hat when I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I made it out of an old party hat. I thought it was very funny. And even when I was wearing my dunce hat, people would turn to me and say, we need to evaluate this as critically as possible. And I thought, well, hello, Agnes. I've, uh, I've got some training in that. So in many respects, it's worked out quite well. I can't guarantee you that uh, if you do what I did, and to some extent still do, that everything's going to be particularly straightforward. I mean, I do not recommend mass antagonism of people who make decisions about what gets published in journals and uh, who the editors are, um, senior people within your field. I strongly do not recommend that you blanket antagonize these people. And this is one of the reasons that almost no one does uh, frontline meta scientific criticism of journals themselves what happens if you go and evaluate a journal and then tell them that you don't like their policy you think you'll be publishing it anytime soon no so when i still do a little bit of this that's what i confine myself to i like now the things that i'm allowed to say simply because i say i can and there isn't anyone who can sack me and if you write to the ceo and tell him that i've been a very naughty boy he will laugh right in your face now, I know that's probably different to what you were expecting as a perspective, but that's all I've got. Happy to take questions. Great. Thanks so much, James. So we have one more panelist before we get to the Q&A. So if you do have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them soon. And our last panelist is the person who James referred to, who has been active in the chat already, providing some insight. And so we're happy to welcome Jody Schneider, who's an assistant professor in the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And she runs the Information Quality Lab there, where she studies scholarly communication, science of science, and especially controversies in science. And she's held research positions in many different countries, uh, the US, Ireland, England, France, and Chile, and has uh, held research grants from um, funders in many of these countries. So a broad range of different funders, including an NSF career grant. So Jody, welcome and let us, share, let us hear your perspective. Thank you so much. This is what a great group to be uh, a part of. And I, I violently agree with everything that's um, been said uh, so far. Um, and I guess one thing to say right off is um, we've got postdoc jobs if you're um, on the market. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about what I think meta science is. This is this gave me uh, some, you know, had some thinking to do. I'll give you a couple examples of projects I'm currently working on, um, my background, and then some advice uh, for pursuing meta research. Um, so I don't think that meta research, meta science is really one thing. I think it's this conglomeration of related interdisciplinary fields that are all kind of abutting one another and, um, and, and sort of related. Um, so journalology, which is looking at peer review, reporting standards, peer registration, um, various fields that are looking at evaluation and incentives. Um, and some of those are fairly established um, comparatively, um, science policy and, and science metrics. Then there's a whole area of knowledge synthesis where people are maybe doing evidence synthesis, meta-analysis, semantic publication, living systematic reviews. Um, and then science communication, I think is, is you know, a, a related, I don't know if it's a meta-science, but it's, it's certainly related. Um, and, then, and then team science. So all of these things I see at least uh, as meta-science research areas. And as Carl said, there isn't, there aren't faculty lines that are, are that say meta-science. There are occasionally um, labs that are in these areas or perhaps you have a department of STS or a department of you know, complexity network science that might have some of the scientometrics folks or, or something like this. Um, so if, you're, if, if this is the field that you are trying to go into as an academic, um, I think going at it kind of sideways or, or maybe that, that sort of you know, zigzag is, is really a way to think about it. Um, 
And so another way that I'm thinking about um, this is they're sort of meta disciplines. So uh, Marcia Bates, who's an information scientist, um, has written about information disciplines, education and communication journalism as these meta disciplines where they kind of span over um, the spectrum of the traditional research disciplines. And I think the meta in, in meta science or meta research to me is really that it's about spanning and it's about not being necessarily in you know, one of these, these things. Though um, what happens I think is, is kind of the other way around is that every way that we have of looking at the world through science, whether it's birds or, or whatever else, every way that we have of looking at the world, we can apply to put that lens on scholarship, research, science, whatever it is that you want to, to call it. Um, and, and to me, this is a really important thing to do. Um, and um, so I'll tell you about a couple of projects that I've been working on recently. So um, I'm, I'm just at the very end of a project called Reducing the Inadvertent Spread of Retracted Science. This has been um, going on. In fact, we got funding in February, 2020. We thought we were gonna do an, um, uh, a workshop for a day and a half in, in Chicago in September, 2020, which um, turned out to be three half days online with a diverse bunch of people from across different aspects related to um, publishing, related to, to research. Um, so that was a project that involved both um, talking to people, right, interviews and, 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 and this workshop and sort of consultation and doing um, a citation analysis to try to understand what is going on in, you know, what, what citation is there to retracted science. Answer is people have been studying it for, for 30 years in Centimetrics um, and there's still way too much inadvertent citation, right, people citing retracted stuff without being aware um, in the medical literature, which is the easiest place to study um, the numbers that we find are in the, the mid 90s, something like 94% of post retraction citations are just completely um, without awareness. Um, then, you know, what sort of outcomes come from a project like this? Well, you know, we publish things, um, but it turns out that more so than the publications, uh, the most important outcome is actually not papers, it's stuff happening in the real world. Um, so in um, uh, about five weeks ago, the, in, in May, uh, a, a standards group got started underneath the National Information Standards Organization. This was like getting that started was, you know, write a position paper, get the, the um, you know, group of people who decide, you know, is this a worthwhile information standard to start developing? Um, you know, move that forward. And then it will be another 18 months, 24 months to have something to recommend out to publishers. Say, how should these things that are retracted, what should the display standards be? What should the metadata standards be? And so on. Um, and so there's, there's a, a, a place for documents in this um, and a place for, you know, um, code that runs literature reviews and displays a website. But the things that are, that, that to me are really valuable are how do we actually change science itself? And one of the papers that we wrote about was very much about the process and was looking at this sort of participatory um, design piece of, of that. Um, so the new project that I'm, I'm just started working on, right, this is not quite a year in, is a project that's looking at how can we tell, should we have confidence in research um, or not? If we look at a whole body of research in a topic what are the signs that we can look for that tell us that um, people are um, you know, agreeing and seeing the same thing? Or wh what are the signs that, that perhaps we need to do more um, research? And I know that a lot of people have gotten into reproducibility because of um, stories about translating research. Um, and, and we've mentioned cancer biology, lots of these have, have come out of um, cancer biology or, or out of Alzheimer's research where um, somebody in, in drug development goes to take some, some university research and it doesn't actually translate. Um, so I think this, this notion of when is research um, ready to be, to be used as opposed to there's more basic research to be done. Um, and there's a, a fantastic paper by um, Stephen Greenberg about the Alzheimer's case that, that's inspired me a lot. Um, so, so here, um, the idea is from, you know, one side, let's look at 
what are some of the network structures that we see? Are there any signatures that we can see there from a distance, right? I mean, how do you tell whether research is good at, you know, you have to get kind of close up to it, really. But um, but how, what's what can we look at from a, from a distance? Um, the other aspect that we're looking at is who is responsible for the research. We know that in um, in many cases um, there's um, intentional um, misinformation and disinformation that um, um, that that has been um, been put forward. Right? Is is in translating. Um, science into public policy as opposed to into just you know sort of more you know, down down the road of, of, of science translating into um in, in, into public policy there there are lots of actors who want um you know want things to happen their way um and the you know infamous cases would would be climate change or um tobacco so how can we understand um what are um the um, you know, where is the research coming from? Can we see potential places where, where bias is in? People who, who are looking, um, you know, philosophy is a great discipline that's contributing interesting things to meta research, for instance, looking at how um, some amount of funding um, can, can produce bias in a field, even if no individual researcher is biased. Um, and, and so there are you know, phenomena there to look for. So those are sort of examples of the kind of meta research um, that I'm doing. Um, what sort of background am I coming from? Well, basically a little bit of everything. Um, I started out in college, I couldn't decide what I wanted to um, study, whether I wanted to be on the humanities side or the, or the math, uh, you know, technical side of things. So I went someplace where I wouldn't have to pick a major. Um, St. John's, which is a great books oriented school in the US in Annapolis, Maryland and Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, and one of the amazing things about not having a major was being able to sell to a lot of people who were looking for undergraduate researchers that, that I could do that thing that they were interested in. So I wound up as, um, as an undergrad getting to um, tour the country and to a little, a little bit uh, to, to Chile as well to do uh, research. That actually gave me an entree into um, in, into grad school in math, um, and and after four years at, at UT Austin, decided no, I didn't want to be a math professor um, because nobody seems to want to learn math, um, and, and so I moved into uh, be working doing insurance math, um, and then uh, went to to be a gift buyer for a, a small bookstore, which then, as I realized. That was not a financially sustainable uh, career. Got into uh, a science library, working, and then and then doing an online degree at, at the the place that I, I now am am a, a professor. So um, so it seems to me that that you know among the, the these fields that are adjacent to meta research, libraries are, are really one of these fields. Um, even in 2006, when I when I started um, in um, library school. Um, it was a place where I could, you know, be interested in scholarly communication and, and more or less be studying scholarly communication. And it's been something I've been doing since then. Um, so I, I moved abroad for um, uh, for my PhD, kind of by happenstance. I saw a, a tweet. <laughs> Someone was was looking at applied on a lark. Oh, they're not going to take me, and they did. So I went to work at, you know, sort of um, the interface of, of the social semantic web and argumentation, um, which, which led me to um, uh, visiting uh, spaces in the UK and France, and um, then, then back to the US while I was waiting for my then spouse to uh, be able to move back. Um, and, and so since then, I've been uh, here at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, um, as an assistant professor and just about to be promoted in the um, in, in August. So um, if you want to be a, a meta researcher, right, what advice do I have? This is an interdisciplinary field. You need some knowledge of at least one discipline. Um, and, and I would say you really benefit from a wide network. It's probably possible to, to do this work without, but you benefit from a wide network. You have to be curious, you have to be flexible. Um, I think collaborating is, is the way to go. Um, and, and we've heard 
about open data and transparency and the approaches that people use for you know just doing things in digital spaces and i think that that those kinds of finding what the best practices are showcasing them being a leader in your discipline your current discipline um, for those will help you be adjacent to these to these spaces um and i i don't think that that just because it's research it has to happen in academia and i see a lot of these spaces where meta research um, is really happening and sometimes where people actually are publishing about or innovating in these spaces um, and so some nonprofits. Um, publishers, um, you know, R&D spaces and publishers, but also the people who are doing innovation, right? I mean, preprint servers, um, database, um, you know, work and so on. Um, there, I, I've seen people leave, um, uh, you know, finish the PhD and then go into consulting. Lots of very well-paid work that you can, can get if you're willing to uh, take that risk and hang out uh, your own um, shingle and whatnot. Funding agencies do do this sort of work as well, um, both the national and international ones and um, foundations. Um, then there's there's also work um, a little bit more ad hoc at scientific societies, right? All of the places that that this stuff is happening, um, and NGOs, and then of course there are non-academic, I mean they're non-professor track, non you know um, tenure stream uh, jobs at universities. Mm -hmm. That's often in places where researchers so you know can you herd cats um if you can herd cats in in an academic environment you are super valuable because boy that's challenging so so facilitating research in in various ways um often people want to know well how do you facilitate research better i mean this is one of the things that carl started with is you know how do we do it better is is often one of the motivating questions so actually doing that alongside your um, your your work and I'm sure there are plenty of other other spaces um, but but certainly it's um, you know there there isn't um, you know the the it's it's not a field that you can just say okay now I'm I here here it is and and this is this is that it's it's a, a really good place to be but but not an easy place to um, to you know have a sign that says professor of meta research on your on your door. So thanks. Great, thank you so much. Um, so that's the end of the presentations. And now we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. And there's already some great questions and some answers in the chat. And I apologize for anyone watching the video later on that you won't be able to see the chat. So I'll make sure to say repeat the questions here. Um, and yes, just as a reminder, this is being recorded. And so if you have your video on, you will be on the recording. So feel free if you don't want to be on the recording, but you have a question, just put it in the chat. Um, and so I'm the first question that was in the chat was a question about at what point in someone's career is it a good time to start doing meta research, maybe after tenure? And how long do we think it'll take for academic institutions to formally realize that they need researchers in their department that evaluate research and so on, do meta research? Um, and subsequently for there to be jobs and funding for this. I think the jobs versus funding is quite different. So maybe let's take the jobs question, like at what point one, one's career, right currently under current conditions in academia, at what point one's career should one like devote most of one's time to meta research if that's what one wants to do? And how long do we think it'll be before academic institutions hire tenure streamlines in meta research? So feel free, right. go ahead. And address that, yeah. I mean, so I think, I mean, I'm not sure about spending most of your time doing meta science research, but I would get started right now. If you have interest in it, um, get started right now. Don't necessarily try to position yourself as someone who does only meta research, but there is always room to have an interesting side project. Uh, and you know, as uh, you know, as has been pointed out, you can have um, you know. Uh, Jennifer talked about how uh, there the sort of resource demands are way lower, and you can kind of you know the time in which you can work on such things is is different. You can it's it's a it, meta research can 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 have a, a really be a, can be a great thing to be doing as side projects. And you know the entire time I was uh, supposed to be getting tenure, I was spending about maybe a third of my time working on uh, uh, the sort of the complete scam that that's commercial journal publishing. Um, and, you know, I think that is a, a quite reasonable thing to do because it brings a lot of, uh, it brings a lot to who you are as a researcher. Um, you know, uh, it, it makes you a better researcher, as James pointed out, and it makes 
means you better understand the world and then it also and and the kind of science you're doing and it also uh it also makes you interesting to a wider range of people it'll get you you know more invitations to speak we've been talking about that so there's a whole bunch there's a whole bunch of upsides um you know around that and so I would say, don't wait, you know, dive in, find something that you enjoy that maybe even matches up, you know, maybe you can find something that relates to your field, um, you know, that kind of matches up, work on that and, uh, and see where it gets you. Yeah, don't be, don't be put off by the fact that look, there's, there's a broad spectrum of implied criticism within meta-scientific projects. Some of it is collectively regarded as a lovely thing to do. Um, you make a lot of friends. It isn't all storming the ramparts and busting down the barricades. I mean, there can be elements of that. Some people can be told things they don't want to hear, but that's not a strategic reason not to begin, especially if you're going to do a project that has bearing or relevance to what you're learning about what you're already interested in. I mean, this is, it's, it's really difficult to argue with um, the, the perspective of... You know, do I, do I want to understand this better from a broader context that, that has, um, has its tendrils out into other areas? Do I want to be one of Jody's network maps all by myself? Yo, yeah, I mean, sure. Incidentally, those network maps are dope and we should talk about those. Sorry. Great, thanks. And I'll throw in my own question kind of related to this one, which is, you know, Carl, you mentioned that uh, you'll have an audience for meta research because people, researchers like to hear about themselves. And I think that's definitely true. Um, but I think one thing that's hard about positioning yourself within the academic job market, at least, and I'd be curious to hear from James or anyone else about if this is different in the non-academic job market, is that it's hard to pitch yourself and emphasize your strengths when those strengths are basically what everyone already thinks they're good at. So you're saying, you know, I study research methods, I study research quality and research evaluation. Well, we're all authors of papers and reviewers of papers. We think we're doing that already and we're doing it well. How do you go into a department and tell them, if you hire me, I will help make everyone's research better when that's what they already think the research is pretty good and it sounds kind of condescending, right? And I'm curious if that like tightrope is easier to walk for non-academic job interviews, for example, because there isn't that, not, the people you're talking to don't necessarily think of themselves as experts on research quality already. Hell yeah. Look, I've been, I've been called doctor just randomly in the last two years, not because I ask people to like more times in the rest of my life put together like 10 X. Um, and I work in a lot of contexts where I'm contacting other scientists and working with researchers and that no, no matter where you end up you're going to be in an environment even if you go and work at Pfizer or Amgen or somewhere where you're actually doing bench science there's gonna be plenty of people in the room who aren't actually scientists um we sincerely underestimate a lot of the time the kind of gravitas that something like this is that confers in a lot of other contexts I mean, it really is a very, very different environment and other people will take you really seriously in a way that you will not take yourself. Um, so I didn't, I didn't see any immediate drawbacks to, I mean, this is what I actually worked on was how to make this better because you're doing some variant of it a lot of the time anyway. Um, and it, look, in general, I think one of the things that, I mean, there's a lot of bad things not to like about corporate life in general. But one of the things that everyone who has, I mean, I know people now, Boston PhDs, a lot of them have absolutely no plans to do anything academic whatsoever. They're trying to graduate and get a job because this is biotech capital of the country. Um, no one would ever go, oh, what, you're really good and critical and you spend a lot of time thinking about processes? How dare you? That hurts our feelings. Now, in general, the incentives are the right way around a lot of the time. I mean, look, I'm building medical devices right now. If I, I can't get them published, they have to work. And in fact, they have to be really good. Um, they, they have to provide the right kind of outcomes to people. They have to be regulatory appropriate within the regulatory framework. It's like, let's so, see, you know, if I put accuracy fetishist on my CV and then send it to people, no one would go, oh, dear me. How, how could you, sir? That hurts my feelings. <laughs> I was called that once, amongst other things. I yield my time. Anyone else want to jump in or we'll move on to the next question? 
All right. So Adrian asks in the chat, um, given the potential to upset powerful people, and there's a bit of discussion in the chat about antagonizing journals and so on and editors, um, is it the case that meta researchers need to be especially thick skinned? I mean, powerful people, when you antagonize them, tend to just uh, stab you in the back rather than call you names. James has had some unfortunate uh, experiences to the contrary, but, uh, um, uh, you know, Getting I think- Getting in and making friends, bro. Yeah, exactly. I know. I know. Well, you're, think stabbing the back is better than being called names? I'm not sure which is- Oh, no, it's just it's, it's just the thick skin isn't going to save you, save you from being stabbed in the back, that's all. Um, you know, so- uh, um, but I, you know, again, I, I, it is possible to, oh gosh, how do I say this? Most meta, yeah, I mean, it totally depends on what you're working on. Like, you know, most kinds of meta science research aren't going to necessarily antagonize specific people or specific journals or whatever, but then, and, and you, and you know perfectly well, whether you are or aren't, um, uh, because, you know, if you're going to go finding that, you know, uh, Elsevier is a, is a total ripoff and has been returning 43% uh, um, uh, growth every year for, for decades and, and we're stuck paying for it, then, uh, then yeah, when you, you know, tell people, when you make, when you go tell your library to stop subscribing to them and they listen, yeah, people are going to be mad. But it's like, if you're, you know, doing good work about understanding the you know, community, you know, the sort of, uh, you know, network ep epistemology of a field, you know, that's not pissing people off. That's just helping people understand it. So you kind of know what you're getting into um, to some extent as well. And so like, it's not that like all of meta science research is just about pissing off people that do science. Um, though, though one can of course choose to do that if one enjoys such things. I, I might, you know, I, I've, I've met such people. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cal, I might just add to that. I think you know it's true that we can upset journals, but at the end of the day, there's far more readers. You know, there's far more people reading the journals than there are journals themselves. And I think for us, it's a lot of it's about articulating your value proposition and who you're speaking to. You know, we're trying to speak to the users of the literature whose needs are, I think, just you know, completely out the door in terms of what journals are prioritising. So. You know, if you, if you can articulate your value and who you're speaking to, perhaps that can sort of, you know, counter, counterbalance some of the, the negativity. Great, thanks. Does anyone have a question that they want to ask either out loud or in the chat? Otherwise, I have one more that I'll <laughs> raise. Um, so I once heard a very uh, experienced meta researcher express a very strong view that people should not go straight into meta research. They should get experience as a researcher in a more traditional discipline first. I'm curious what people on this panel think. Yes. By straight, I mean Even, straight after. Yes, <laughs> I think I think you have to have some experience at you know graduate level, um, at least as a as a graduate researcher, ideally as a postdoc, um, and perhaps beyond in some discipline because you, you these these things even if you're just you know looking um in in one in one lens you have to have some lived experience to draw on and and i think there are so many things that you would be just really naive about if you didn't if you came in just looking at things as as a meta researcher um and you know it's there, there's just a lot that you can't learn except by by living it yeah, I'd actually, I'd actually possibly disagree, Jody, because I, th I kind of view meta research as a little bit like bioinformatics was about 20, 30 years ago. You know, people in those days said you can't, you have to do, you have to do wet lab research, or else you can't do bioinformatics. I mean, how can you understand? You have to understand biology to do bioinformatics. And now people just do bioinformatics, you know, from when they were born. So, you know, it could be an indication that meta research is still a sort of an undeveloped field. And, um, you know, I do certainly agree with you, you know, you have to talk to people and you have to collaborate across boundaries, but perhaps you're getting to a stage where maybe you can start in meta research and have great collaborators like yourself. It, it may depend to start on... supervised by one of those uh, hypothetical faculty members we keep talking about. Yeah, uh, I think that's, that, that, that is the, uh, uh, 
I, I agree with everything Jody said completely. Um, I used to I used to refer to this as my amateur sociology hat. At the point in time where you become interested in the sort of the, the people and the processes and the systems and the things that are brought in the data that you put within them, and when you really understand one well, and it's been the jumping off point. Um, yeah, it feels it it feels I I wouldn't even I wouldn't even know where to start to give someone advice on how, you know I want to be a meta researcher that's too broad in its conception as a question to say like exactly where you uh, put that pin. Um, no, also, you know, at some point in time when this faculty job show up, you're going to want to fall back on being a biologist or, you know, something like that. <laughs> I'll be tongue in cheeks. I mean, please don't yell at me. No, I um, suspected the question would lead to a divide. And I think I'm more on Jenny's side that I think it is possible and fruitful to go straight, you know, from undergraduate or something into meta research. I think for me, part of it is that what I perceive as graduate training in, in my field in psychology is often kind of unlearning idealism and good values that undergraduates have. And so in some ways, if they go straight from undergraduate, they maintain those idealistic and I think appropriate values and have this sense of like, no, it shouldn't be okay to do this, that if they go through graduate school and get trained into what's normal, then you have to almost untrain that. Um, so I think there's some advantage in the same way that, you know, philosophers of science or, or people who study science who've never necessarily been scientists themselves can sometimes point things out that feel like a branch in our own eye that we didn't see. So I'm, yeah, I, I see arguments on both sides. I think it's an interesting question. Yeah, Larry, go ahead. Could, could uh, some of you describe or define what you mean exactly by meta meta research? because it seems to be pretty broad and I'd like to get a better understanding of what you mean. I've got a background in meta-analysis, but it sounds like there's a lot more yeah. than that involved. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's necessarily one definition that everybody agrees with, um, but I think that one that I've kind of come to find useful is people who, who study research using research tools, so do research on research, and often with the goal of trying to improve it. So often it's it has a component of it that's maybe a little bit of an activist agenda of like, how can we uh, study what is currently the case, but also how we can move towards more ideal um, practices. Um, so it overlaps a lot with sociology of science, with philosophy of science, with science studies, with infome infometrics, things like that. Um, but I think one of the unique angles on it is maybe that it is, maybe because so far most people who get into it were converted to it from seeing problems in their own disciplines. It's at least so far had a tradition of having this kind of um, agenda of wanting to improve the state of practices and, and norms in the fields, in their fields. But it, it's still kind of evolving, I think, what exactly it is. All right, thank you. We're out of time now. So I just wanna thank everyone, especially the panelists, but thank you to all of you for joining and for your questions. and. Yeah, look, there's another session tomorrow. It'll be at a, in a very different time. So evening Australia, morning Europe, and nighttime in the Americas. And obviously there are other parts of the world besides those, but um, so yeah, it'll, it'll be a completely different set of panelists. So come hear more perspectives and- You scared me for a minute. Oh shit, what did oh, I agree yeah, to? I'm sorry, <laughs> no, not you guys. Yeah, but thank you everybody. Thanks for thank coming. Thank you so much. Thanks.